and thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, first thing I would like to say is that I'm not an expert on, um, on isolation or uh, loneliness, um, but I was invited to uh, think about some of the challenges that we face when um, trying to understand, evaluate uh, prevention interventions in social care and how those challenges might apply to interventions which are aiming to reduce social isolation um, and decrease uh, loneliness. The other thing um, that I wanted to say before I start was that I found it slightly difficult to pitch the presentation because of the wonderful mixture we've got of uh, researchers, people from local authorities, voluntary sector. And so I, I, you know, I thought perhaps uh, the most useful thing to do was to uh, you know, pitch the presentation in terms of what are the challenges for somebody who's either commissioning, uh, uh, you know, trying to understand, uh, evaluate the, the, um, you know, an intervention either as a commissioner or as a provider of those, of those uh, services. Um, and the aims of the presentations are summarized uh, in this slide. Um, so first of all, I would like to say a little bit, you know, a couple of slides about what do I mean by uh, an evaluation, uh, you know, which, try, you know, which things are we trying to really understand, which, uh, which uh, findings are we trying to uh, obtain, and then think about, okay, how easy is that to do in the social care area in general and thinking about uh, social isolation interventions in particular. And then think about, well, okay, given those challenges, which principles might we want to um, you know, abide by in order to come up with evaluations which are robust and which can inform um, decisions about our services? And, and the last line is, is a plug. I think you know, uh, most of the speakers I've seen uh, you know, were plugging themselves, so uh, you know, why not? Uh, this is a, a plug, a study that we are going to, uh, we're about to start, funded by the School for Social Care Research, and which is likely to be looking at uh, interventions which might reduce uh, social isolation. Okay, so, um, what are the aims of an economic evaluation? And I thought at one point I might uh, open it up for discussion. I thought, no, there's 200 people here, we, we better not. But if you, if you open that sort of, if you make that sort of um, place, that sort of question to students, you might, you, you, you get things like, well, it's, you know, if we're evaluating an intervention, we're trying to understand whether something, the intervention is good, you know, whether it, it, it's, it's leading to something good. And, and given the area that we're working on, typically is, well, is this improving somebody's well-being, somebody's, you know, um, is this helping uh, people? And, and I guess that's, that's part of every single one of the uh, evaluations that we would want to do. And, and uh, Dave, for example, has mentioned a lot of um, uh, evaluations which are looking at this, this part which we talked about uh, defined as the effectiveness. So is, do I implement something and as a result of that, do I, imp I improve things in terms of for example, health status, quality of life, both of the person, but also of family and friends. Um, and of course, you know, if we're thinking about uh, social isolation and, and uh, loneliness, then you know, things like social participation and, and, and so on. And that's obviously very important. You know, are we, um, can we measure the impact that the intervention is going to have on the relevant outcomes? What I would like to say, though, from start, is that just focusing on, on isolation or loneliness is, is likely to undermine uh, the value, the true value of those interventions, because those interventions might well lead to improvements in a much broader range of outcomes. And therefore, if you want to really understand the worthiness of, of an intervention, you might want to go much broader than just purely uh, isolation or uh, loneliness. And so, but this, it's not just about whether we're having an effective intervention. It's not just about whether, um, you know, we're leading to some improvement. It's also about whether the resources that we need to invest, and this is a particularly important point in the present day, where there's really, local authorities are struggling for money, where there's been a 40% reduction in, 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 in the coverage of uh, um, social care services for all the people in the last five years. You know, in this sort of context, then it's not just about whether we're leading to an improvement, it's whether it is worth the, the resources that we're having to invest. So is it worth the effort? Um, and, and therefore, it's not just about the, the outcomes, it's also about understanding the costs, the resources, and, and, and putting the two together. And, and measuring those resources and measuring the costs associated with those. And again, it's not just about understanding the, the intervention costs, but it's also the costs that might change as a result of the intervention for a wider range of, of services. And, you know, um, we hear very often um, anecdotal evidence about uh, lonely older people uh, just um, um, 
ending up in A and E, okay, as a result of that. Oh, am I touching this? Sorry. Does it add a, an effect that particularly, you know? <laughs> anyway, so, you know, we want to go broader as well in terms of the, of the resources that we measure. And therefore, what we want to really understand, as an economist, I would say at least, is the cost effectiveness of those interventions, the balance between the resources we need to bring in and the outcomes that we uh, achieve as a result of that. And that's it. That was the end of the presentation. It's a very simple thing to do. You know, it's uh, costs, outcomes, that's it, the difference between the two. Um, it's a bit more complicated than that, and that's what uh, you know, I'm going to go into uh, in terms of, um, in particular, in the, in the area of social care. Um, and it's challenging because of a number of things. Um, partly about measuring outcomes and costs is quite dif difficult. And already we've heard um, you know, debates about which scale we want to use in order to measure loneliness or social isolation. Is social isolation the relevant thing or loneliness? Uh, but, but the same applies to a much broader range of, of outcomes that we might want to map. And I'll talk about, a little bit about that. But also the fact that we're talking about interventions and needs which are there for a long period of time, and that's a, a challenge as well. Um, and then the, the big challenge of actually identifying the contribution of the intervention to outcomes, not just the outcome in general, not measuring the outcome overall, but how much has that outcome improved as a result of the intervention, the identification problem. Okay, so in terms of outcomes, in social care, and many of the interventions to, for reducing uh, social isolation could be broadly grouped within the social care area, um, outcomes tend to be very complex, they're multidimensional, quite often you expect the outcomes naturally to deteriorate through time, and therefore you have to account for that if you're looking at changes through time, you might want to consider the fact that people are deteriorating quite often, um, naturally. Um, sometimes there are competing outcomes, so you know, an improvement in one outcome might be you know, an intention with uh, you know, improvements in, in other dimensions of well-being. And, uh, and process, and the way by which you, you help people, in the nature of the intervention and the day-to-day -day of that intervention tends to be very important. So those are all challenges which are common across social care interventions, which I, but I think are um, very relevant as well for um, interventions aiming to reduce social isolation. And so, you, you know, just measuring those outcomes is going to be complicated. Um, there's more and more work about new measures, um, wor uh, work about measures which try to encompass a broad range of dimensions of well-being and quality of life. I'm just plugging one from PSSRU, which is uh, the ASCOT measure, which also touches on, um, on social participation and involvement as one of the dimensions it mentions, it, it covers. And it's important because then it allows you to then add those, aggregate all those effects together and, and try to get some overall you know, measure of, of outcome. But you know, this is a very, very broad subject which we could spend days uh, discussing. So, but but th th there's, the, there's a, um, a big uh, challenge. And it's not just, as I was saying before, the fact that measuring those outcomes is difficult, but it's the fact that what we're after is not the, the overall isolation or the overall loneliness, but how much, if we are evaluating an intervention, how much has that improved as a result of the intervention? Now, I, I'm going to show you, I'm going to illustrate the point I'm trying to make with an intervention which was not uh, aiming to reduce social isolation, but just, just follow me in terms of the, of the general point. And the point is that in order to understand the contribution of the intervention to outcomes, we need to control for risk factors. And this has been repeated this morning in a number of ways. Um, so, this, this is, I'm going to go very quickly in terms of, I'm not going to give you the, the details of the study, but here we're, we're trying to understand whether by providing people with services in the community, they stayed longer, they, they, you know, we, we extended how long uh, they remained in the community before going into residential care, okay? Now let's just focus on those three. Usually I walk, but I don't know if you hear me, if I speak like this. Yes? yes. Okay, so we've got, let's just focus on these three groups, okay? The, the height gives you how long these all the people were able to stay in the community before going into residential care. The height of those uh, columns, therefore, is, a, is, you know, um, is the total length of stay in the community. It then divides between the length in the community, which is linked to needs, okay, which is this color, this uh, yellow, and the length of stay, which was due to the positive effect of services in the community, which is depicted by the, these three colors, okay? Now, the point I want to make is that if you look at people with severe cognitive impairment, 
very needy, much greater levels of need, the overall outcome is much worse. They were going into residential care much faster. However, the impact of the services, i.e. the impact of the intervention, was much bigger. Okay? Now, if you don't control for that, if you don't understand, try to disentangle the effect of services from the effect of needs, you will misinterpret what the services are achieving. You would say, worse outcome for these. But actually, in terms of, the, of contribution from the services, it was the biggest. That's the point I want to make. A related point is that it's not just about the overall contribution, but about also about the way different services will have a different impact on different people. It's the same study. Here we're looking at levels of services, so how many, you know, how many pounds per week of a service you were receiving, and this is how many extra days you were benefiting from. And you find, uh, the red is depicting the effect of daycare services. This is the red with the little balls, the, the little circles there. That's for people with mild or severe cognitive impairment. And this is for the others. Okay? You see how the difference, how, how you know, it's much more effective for some than for others. This is very important. We want to understand the relationship between characteristics of individuals and the effect of those services. Okay? Because they will be mediated by the nature of the needs. Okay, and, and of course, the, 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 uh, the, the characteristics of, of the people that might be receiving our services is likely to be very heterogeneous. There will be dif differences in terms of their physical health, their mental health, their, you know, the nature of the informal networks, um, environmental factors, which were uh, uh, referred to this morning, you know, the source of deprivation, etc., um, and personal traits. Okay, so we need to account for those. I need to kind of... Um, accelerate a little bit, and I know that I speak very fast in the Spanish, uh, you know. Um, anyway, so it's, it, it, it's, uh, the other thing is, is about how we measure costs. And the costs are not just simply the costs of the intervention, but the cost of the services which might be affected by the intervention, because we might have savings. Whether we put them into benefits or costs, you know, we can discuss about. But it, what is important is that we need to map a broad range of resource utilization because those might be affected by the intervention, okay? And therefore, well, I might, I might uh, skip that or talk about it very quickly, but basically, you know, ultimately, an evaluation, a good evaluation would need to cover these things. We'd need to cover, we'd need to map need-related factors, we'd need to map services, and we'd need to map outcomes in order to be able to understand the relationship between those, those three, okay? And yes, we do need a better understanding of production of wealth across it. <laughs> but this is an important point. I mean, in social care, sometimes we just, uh, and in the broad social care area, let's say, we often just uh, don't almost give up on this expectation that we should be able to identify what works for whom. And I think it's possible to do, and we need to make that effort to do it. Okay, then another challenge is the fact that, this is the minister, by the way, going, God, grant me patience, hurry up. This is the minister that has the, uh, commissioned the research and cannot wait for the, uh, the answer. And therefore, the, you know, the, inter the, the evaluation is lasting half the time it, use, it should. And, and this is an important point, because if we want to really understand the uh, true impact of some of these preventative interventions, it's something that's going to take time and that we're going to have to you know, follow over a long period of time. And this is a challenge. It's a challenge for the commissioners of the research and the researchers themselves. And therefore, we need to map the causal processes. And this, you know, was, was talked about this morning. You know, a social isolation might lead to changes in the quality of life of people, might change to actually health status, um, um, and those might impact on service utilization. You need to understand this, and you need to understand... This morning, in fact, we were talking about an endogenous process, how that actually loops back, and there might be further effects of changes in health status, for example, on uh, isolation, etc. You need to understand that through time. That is challenging. And therefore, we need to understand not just the impact of the intervention on, isolate, on, on loneliness, for example, but also the broader impact on utilization and outcomes and through time. And this is typically what happens. Uh, how much time have I got? 14, you got? Six minutes. Six minutes. You said 14 and then six. <laughs> how much do you want? Uh, okay, six minutes. I'll use one minute for this one. 
Um, so this is this is typically what happens in terms of um, you know the, the, the challenges of, of understanding prevention is that you you might have uh, somebody whose quality of life is likely to deteriorate because that's you know that's where we're all we're all going to die eventually okay and well you know it's not a surprise I hope I'm not surprising anyone <laughs> but. <laughs> What, what you hope to achieve with a prevention intervention is to improve the, the, you know, people's quality of life. Therefore, to move from the blue, you're going to do something and that's going to increase people's quality of life uh, from the blue to the, to the red. This is a data that I made up. Therefore, it fits my arguments very well, as you would expect. <laughs> um, but typically, this is what you're expecting, to move from a blue to red and you do that by some sort of investment at the beginning, okay? Now, the problem is that if you just map, if you just map this, what you see is the increase in investment, which is necessary for the prevention investment, and you don't see a lot of the benefits which are up there, okay? So that's the challenge. It's, it's how you can come up with an evaluation framework which allows you to observe all the relevant bits. I think that was more than a minute. Um, so, <laughs> what are the key principles so far, summarizing what we've said so far, is that, um, and I've missed a key one here, but uh, we absolutely need to try to map all the relevant resources that might be affected by the intervention in addition to the intervention itself, all the relevant outcomes, not just loneliness, I would say, go broader than that because you might find interesting things on other outcomes, and, and of course needs, which is the one that I've missed. Okay. Follow that intervention sufficiently long, okay, so that you're really confident, either with real data or with modeling, some other um, approach. But try to understand the, the, the full uh, impact of those interventions. And then try to use appropriate methods for identifying the specific contribution, you know, the, 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 the attribution effect. Uh, and, and here I can't go into the details because we could, you know, these are courses on each of these. But, and there are a range of methods that can be used. And those methods, what I will say in a second, is that it's very important that you choose those methods which fit the policy process. You know, if, for example, you're just before starting a, you're thinking about developing a new service, you might first of all want to develop a business case on the basis of existing evidence, the sort of evidence that has already been presented today, thinking about, okay, well, the literature tells me that this is the nature of the relationship. Having mapped you know, what you want to observe, then use, use the literature, for example. Um, but if, if once you start uh, piloting that, you might use uh, experimental setups where you've got random allocation systems in order to really try to control for minimize the, 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 the danger of bias in the, in, in, in the nature of the characteristics of your intervention group, if you see what I mean. Um, am, I, am I losing you now? <laughs> yeah? Okay, well, uh, I, is the problem is that these are very big uh, issues in terms of methods, but the idea is that you're going to have to use methods which allow you to be confident that what you observe in terms of the differences linked to your intervention are not differences linked to the characteristics of the people that got that, that intervention. And there's a range of techniques that you can use, uh, but what I'll, I'll uh, say in a second is one, what I was saying a second ago, that, that you want to match those to wherever you are in the policy process, but also uh, to reiterate uh, the point that David was making a second ago, well, 20 minutes ago, um, that actually there is great potential for uh, collaborations between researchers, broadly speaking, and uh, either people developing these new, these new ideas and these new interventions or local authorities. Because I think for us, those are wonderful sources of evidence. And for you, you might be able to use us as a, the, the technical uh, you know, providers of the, the methods for, for actually coming up with an, with an evaluation which is more robust and therefore convinces more the commissioners or convinces you more than that is the right thing to commission. And, and, in, and in fact, this one minute, so I'm going to use 30 seconds. Uh, this is the plug that I wanted to make um, um, at the beginning, or, or now at the end, which is that uh, with the, social, uh, the School for Social Care Research, we're going to start a project, hopefully soon, it's being reviewed at the moment, which will uh, engage in a collaboration with nine local authorities in England in order to try to help them 
collect the right information and use that information that they're collecting in order to get the best understanding about the preventative effects that they're, the services they're commissioning are having. I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. No, that's, uh, I completely agree. Uh, so, uh, my name is Anne Cooper, and I work for the campaign to end loneliness. Um, and maybe this is an unfair question, but um, we've been thinking an awful lot today, and actually the campaign has for the past year, about how to best measure impact of a service on loneliness. So we've heard today about lots of different scales and ways to do that. But if you were going to recommend just three questions or measures to a service, that could you look at some of those additional outcomes? What would you recommend? So, assume they've got a three scale of loneliness, um, loneliness measure, three items of loneliness measure. What else would you recommend that they collect data on regularly at baseline and then every few months? But I wouldn't want to give you three now, which are like the standard approach to um, understanding the broad outcomes of, lon of loneliness interventions. Because depending on the nature of that intervention, they might be more relevant some than others, because they might be targeting a, you know, if you're, for example, targeting using some sort of physical exercise in order to reduce social isolation, that is likely to have a set of collateral outcomes which you will want to, uh, to understand. If you're dancing or singing with Dave, um, that will have uh, another set of, uh, you know, appropriate outcomes. The point I think that I was trying to make is that you need to really map in, uh, clearly what are you expecting your intervention to lead to. And both in terms of the impact on outcomes, uh, quality of life, etc., but also in terms of resource utilization, because that might have an impact on acute care use, or might not, depending on the nature of the intervention. And then try to collect that data. And if you can't, if you really cannot, then to try to incorporate evidence which might be available in the literature, with a caveat that, one, the literature is very small, really, in terms of this uh, evidence, and two, that um, the implementation of some of those schemes really varies. And therefore, you know, you have to be, you know, you have to make an assumption about the, the, the appropriateness of those results for your case. Okay, thank you for the question back there. So if you just go to the back first, then come back down, then we'll do those two and go to the panels. Hi, I'm Marcus Green, UK. Um, just a question on data and the sharing of data. Um, how much of an issue or barrier do you think it is that when we're looking at loneliness and social care interventions on later outcomes, and actually often social care and health data is almost as sort of fragmented as the system itself in some ways. Um, and do you see opportunities to use existing quite large scale social survey data in conjunction with some of the smaller data sets we've got when we're using, when we're actually running interventions to possibly match people and then look at outcomes that way? Do you see that as a big yeah, opportunity? Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, in the, 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 I removed the presentation, but one of the strategies that I was suggesting there was matching. So you might be able to match from ELSA, for example, against the sample of people in your, 
it's, it has limitations because obviously you're making a, you know, the assumption that you're able to match on all the relevant characteristics and sometimes that's difficult. Um, I just, I'm, um, and, and obviously just using ELSA, for example, as uh, one of the papers this morning uh, did, is, 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 is something that we should absolutely do. The, I'm very excited about the opportunities that lie out there in terms of existing data, uh, both administrative records from local authorities, but also the voluntary sector. Sometimes those might require tweaking. So they might require, in my experience, uh, you know, a process of um, a agreement. You know, there's always a tension. The, the researchers going, you want to ask this, 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 and they say, impossible. You know, we're not going to get that, uh, those data. But sometimes small tweaks to existing data collection mechanisms make them fit for the purpose of evaluation. And I'm really excited to really develop that sort of um, um, well, partnership, I guess. Okay, and then just one question for everyone. Yes, please. Sorry. Yes, please. Um, and I just had a couple of comments, really. One from the, the last one, I think the, the, the issue of data linkage is really important and will be more so in the future. Um, I have just started a, to develop a cohort of frail older people, and we um, ask it to compare the consent process the data leakage into other sets of data that might be available in the future, which will be um, really interesting for us. And the other thing I just wanted to comment on was um, your uh, <coughs> suggestion that we have as broad outcomes as possible. And uh, one of the things we were debating in, um, in my team the other day, just over coffee, was the focus on primary outcomes um, in funding applications and often a piece of research. So if you go back to the previous speaker, if you do run a, a randomized control trial on the intervention and you've got a primary outcome which the funders always ask for and that's not significant at the analysis, then it will pass or fail on that. And even though there might be secondary outcomes that are interesting and important and worth developing, the funding just ends. <laughs> well, I, I would agree with you that that's an issue and that we need to be a bit more flexible uh, about how we, uh, we treat um, primary and secondary outcomes. I agree. Okay, we're going to end the session there. Thank you for having us again.